Hey, hey everybody, I hope you're doing well today. My name is Brad Cartwright and the following video is a free preview from bradcartwright.com, a website designed for Ivy economic students all around the world so that you know you will have all of the information you need to feel empowered for a unit test, a semester exam, or ultimately the IB exam at the end of your two year journey. So take a look at the website when you get a chance and in the meantime, enjoy this free preview. All right, now let's take a look at the cognitive biases and how they affect our decision making process. And what, what you got to realize here is like the, the, the classical economists believe that we're just these like consumers that just made perfectly rational decisions. And that's not the case. We're human beings, right? So these biases, and there are a lot of them, don't get overwhelmed when I show you the first slide here. They're just going to lay out another set of framework upon which behavioral economists um, look at human behavior. And if you look at human behavior that way, well, then you can see that as a result of that, right, they can go and say, well, these people who are making these economic decisions are far more complex than what the neoclassicists said. Okay. So what are they? They are the cognitive bias of availability, the cognitive bias of what's called anchoring bias, framing bias, social conformity, bias, status quo or inertia, bias, loss aversion, bias, hyperbolic discounting bias. There, you got it. <laughs> no, those are, okay, we're going to go through each one of those individually, but you see right there that there's a different type of, 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 of information that behavioral economists bring into the equation to understand how we behave. Okay, so let's take a look at each one of these individually. All right. First of all, availability bias. This is talking about the availability of information that we have to make a decision. So what does that mean? Well, if we have only the information that we have a 65, 70 year old person in our family who is smoking and they've smoked for 50 years, then we would say, you know what? Maybe based on the information we have available to us, that smoking's not so bad. And that would create a bias for us that we would use to then go and buy cigarettes. And a very good example that Jocelyn Blank and Ian Dorton have in their course companion is of idea like if you get information, the available information to you is that, you know, there's a salmonella poisoning as a result of bad chicken being sold in one country. And then you, that's the only information you have. And therefore in your country, you think that buying chicken is bad. Well, then guess what? You're going to only, you're going to take that information. It's going to bias you against the purchasing decision that you make in your own country. Okay. So that's availability bias. Anchoring bias. What's an anchor? An anchor is something that keeps us in place, right? An anchor is something that a boat uses to keep it in place. Well, what's the thing that keeps us in place? Well, the anchor is information about the value of one thing. And this serves as a reference point for, an, for all of our decisions around it. And this is an, ex an example of this is oftentimes in stores, they'll offer a higher price and then discount it. And so you think you're getting a deal, but that's because they anchored you up at this higher price. So if they want to get $10 for a shirt, they might say that, you know, this shirt's $20, but it's 50% off, buy it now. Well, they actually got the price they wanted, but they anchored you higher at a higher price, okay? And this happens a lot and we all fall victim to it because we don't really know what the real price is of the products that we're buying, right? We just assume that the $20 is what it's worth. Um, so we're willing to pay half price, but really they got their full price of $10. Okay, so availability bias and anchoring bias. The next two are something called framing bias and social conformity bias. Framing bias is pretty interesting. You know, think about a frame, right? Picture frame. Well, that frame sets the standard upon which we would make decisions. So framing bias is the way in which we learn about something. The way it is framed to us initially impacts our final decisions. And the great example, and this is all over the place in marketing, is when you see something that says 90% fat free. And you're like, oh wow, 90% fat free, that sounds pretty good. But if you flip it around, it's like, man, 10% of that's fat. <laughs> if you saw 10% fat, you might be like, yeesh. But if you saw 90% fat free, you might think, oh wow, that's pretty healthy. Okay, so this is all over the place. We get framed all of the time when it comes to decision-making processes. Okay. Social conformity, my friends, we are humans that, that are 
that are, that, are, that are subject to social conformity. We all, to some degree, want to fit in. And so social conformity is something that really impacts our purchase decisions, even though it's not rational. Like, most of you all are too young, but like, if you just look at Crocs, like Crocs, like the shoes, they're ugly, man. They're super ugly. There's nothing cool about Crocs, except, man, somehow they got cool. Maybe it's the name. Maybe it's how useful they are. Maybe the fact that you can just spray them off of the hose and they're no longer dirty. Or you might actually think they look cool when they look silly. Um, Uggs is another example, like those big furry boots. If you really just look at them, they're kind of uglier. They're certainly not more attractive than some other options, but they just got cool. And therefore, even though we might not think individually that they are cool, our decision process would be affected by the fact that we want to fit in, which is a notion of herd mentality, okay? And then lastly, there's notion of status quo. What does that mean? Well, that just means like it's easier, you know? Um, there are so many examples of this that just inertia, we just do nothing. And the best examples, and this is my own personal thing, like I have a cell phone that's with, with Movistar, which is Telefonica, which is a Spanish company. And you know what? I just like them. I like the logo. I like the colors. And like I get solicitations to change my cell phone company all the time. And maybe I could get like the same service for like, I don't know, five or six dollars cheaper. But I just, ah, it's just a pain. I just got to go in and like change the chip and all the stuff. And I'm like, forget it. So I don't do it. Am I acting rationally? No. Am I maximizing like, you know, my own self-interest to get the cheapest price? No. But, um, so what's explaining my decision? What's explaining my decision is this thing called inertia or status quo. Bank of America, I've lived outside the United States for half of my adult life. I have to keep some money in the United States and Bank of America has provided me great service. And it, I'm, I'm like linked to it and I'm in Chile, so it's hard to change anything. So I might have a savings account there that's getting me like 2% interest and I could go to Wells Fargo and get four, but ugh, man, it's just a pain to change it. And so I won't because it's just too difficult or just, I just don't want to because the status quo is easy enough, okay? Last two, loss aversion bias. People make choices based on not losing something even if the decision is ill-informed. Have you ever seen something say, buy now? Or the best ever is like Travelocity. It says only four seats left at this price. You know, and all of a sudden you feel like, oh God, I'm gonna lose it, I'm gonna lose it, I'm gonna lose it, and you buy it, right? Well, they have to have four seats left, but that doesn't mean they're not gonna open up more seats for that same price. So when we feel like we're gonna lose something, we're biased towards buying something because we don't wanna lose out, right? So they're playing on our psychology to make us buy, which impacts our decision-making processes in economic sense, which is going against, and remember, the critique of consumer rational behavior, consumer rational thinking in the neoclassical model. And then lastly, hyperbolic discounting. <laughs> this is the tendency for humans to prefer short-term rewards over larger, later rewards. We do this all of the time. It just means like, ah, uh, this is like a way of explaining impulse buys. Like it's not something I would normally buy, but it was right there and, it, and I just decided to buy it. Whether that's an ice cream cone, a pack of M&Ms or a Snickers bar or some other sweet that's, you know, that's a part of something that you really want. It's not about the long-term decisions. It's about the moment itself. And this goes back, if you think about it, to the two systems, right? System one, which is this like automatic system that we have, and then the more reflective system. And sometimes we're operating out of that, that automatic system where we just impulse buy. And sometimes we're like, no, well, you know, ice cream's not good for my health. It doesn't really do me anything, any good in terms of nutrition, so I'm not gonna buy it. But man, it's hot. I just want to buy it, right? So we fluctuate between those two worlds and these cognitive biases are the basis upon which behavioral economists build their structure in order to explain to us why it is that humans behave the way they behave and also why the, the neoclassical way of looking at things, the old school way of looking at things is just no longer relevant, all right? How cool is that? Did that explain some of your own behavior? Yeah, of course. Does it explain some of all of our behaviors? Of course. If it's based on, if, if it affects the way you make decisions, I promise you it's gonna affect the way that other people make their decisions as well. And there we have it, my friends, the cognitive biases as to why we make purchase decisions which run against the neoclassical model and support the behavioral economists. All right, my friends, congratulations. We's rolling, we rolling on to the next video.